Feds, welcome to this video. We're going to talk about your Hartlepool United career. 300 appearances. I suppose we'll start with that. What a landmark that is. Yeah, something I, I didn't expect, to be honest. Um, yeah, 2014 now. Um, when I signed, sorry. 2021 now, is it? Yeah, Bloody mental. Hell. I'm lost here. Yeah, <laughs> mental. Yeah, it's mad. I never envisaged that. I don't think you do as a, a footballer when you sign for someone, to be fair. Um, but yeah, seven years down the line, a lot of lows, a lot of highs, so happy days. You talk about lows and highs, we're going to have a little look through your whole Hartlepool United career right in front of us here. Yeah. You can see Nicky Featherston 300, uh, if you want to move over to the next slide. There we are, Nicky Featherston 2014. Big, big beard. Uh, so back to 2014. Yeah, 14. Uh, uh, why, why did you end up actually signing for Hartlepool? You know, you you come off the back of a few years at Walsall. I know you had a you know a few little periods, a few games for Harrogate there as well. What in the end ended up making you come to Hartlepool? Uh, Paul Murray. Um, in my second year at Walsall, I was in and out of the team, and it, I think he was the assistant at Oldham at the time under Lee Johnson, and they actually tried getting me on loan at Oldham the back end of that season, um, and then. Obviously, Musa got the job here, and I got a phone call off him saying to come in, and he wanted me to sign. So that's how I ended up here. To be fair, came down because of Musa. Obviously, you played against the Harley Club. Did you did you know much about in terms of the club and the fans and everything before? You, I know I know you're only based in Hull, so it's not that far away. But how much did you know about Hartley Um, a little bit because I played against the, all the age groups coming through when I was at Hull. We used to play them in in our little league, um, in the youth team league as well. Um, but not not too much really. Just a, as a footballer, I know, as an away player, um, you don't tend to enjoy coming to Hartley Club. Hostile, much, really. if, yeah, hostile, and people seem to think the weather's always terrible up here <laughs> and it's windy. They get that perception that it's really cold and windy every time they come. So I think that that's the main thing that I had on Hartley Club. But I knew it was a, a good club. There was. They'd just gone down from League One, I think, at the time, because I played against them actually for Walsall in League One. So I, I knew they'd just come down, but I didn't know how much they were struggling when I signed. I, I suppose you didn't imagine, though, in 2014 when you signed that you'd probably still be here 300 pages later. No, like I said before, you, you don't envisage that when you when you sign for someone 300, 300 games down the line, yeah. Um, I don't know, there must be 70, I think I was looking, maybe 18 from the all-time list, so it's, it's, only, it's only 17 or 18 that I've, I've played 300 or more for the club, so for me to do that, I definitely didn't see it coming at the time when I signed, because I think I only signed a short-term deal at the time, so for me to come and still be here seven years later, yeah, I you wouldn't see it at all. You want to be in that top 10 though, don't you? <laughs> yep, yeah, I've seen that, uh, 350 I think gets you in the top yeah. 10, but I think Lids is... Maybe 18 games off that now. Uh, we have spoke about it a few times recently because of me coming up to 300. So yeah, top 10 would be nice. Like it, it's not everything for me, but yeah, uh, top 10 would be nice. First season for Hartlepool, and you, you're thrown straight in, really. Yeah, it, yeah. uh, what a crazy, crazy season! The great escape. Obviously, Paul Murray brought you in. It didn't work out for him. We'll, we'll get to the great escape in a second, but Ronnie Moore comes in. Talk about Ronnie Moore for a second and, and that season as a whole. Uh, you know, your, your first season at Hartlepool. Yeah, like I said, I, when I signed for him, I didn't know exactly where there was in league, and I probably signed before looking at league. Looked at the league too, I was absolute <laughs> rock bottom. Um, uh, like I said, they'd just been relegated the season before, so I didn't think they'd be too far down. But uh, yeah, Muzza brought me in. Um, we had a tough start under Muzzle, it didn't last too long and then Ronnie Moore coming in and took over and yeah, um, I don't think I played initially under, under Ronnie and I think it was an injury to um, Matty Dole and that brought me in the team and played a lot of, of games in that great escape season in the end so yeah, just a mad, mad season. Did you recognise as soon as you came in that this was a side that was rock bottom or was it almost a case of a side that shouldn't be there really? Um, I think momentum in football is massive and I think the club had 
that where there was there was going in the wrong way, and um, there was a lot of negativity around the place at the time. Um, but Ronnie Moore came in and changed that. He gave a belief that we could get results, and I think there was 12 points adrift at one point, and I think we put four wins together and a draw, and it got us out of the mess a bit, and uh, we managed to to um, seal it with a game to go. I think Exeter. Yeah, I was yeah, going to say top. Told me through that last game, you know, people like Jordan Hugo, now known as Heroes. Yeah, in yeah I think him and Scotty Fennick got the, the goals in that in that game. I think Exeter at home it was, it was with a yeah. game to go, yeah. yeah. Um, do you remember how much do you remember about that occasion? A lot of players say, you know, it's all sometimes a little bit of a blur when big occasions yeah. like that, but how much how much do you actually remember? But because on the day it, it, was, it was a really emotional day in a way, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, I don't remember too much about it myself, to be honest. Um, I thought we, we played 4 4 2 under Ronnie. <laughs> I know I played in there with Tissue Bowler as well. Um, who else was in there? I think Batesy played that game. Like you say, Hugo gone on to bigger and better things. He ended up getting the winning goal. Scotty Fennick put us 1 0 up. Um, but yeah, just a, a massive sense of relief around the place to, uh, to finally get it done. I it, it was an occasion, and Ronnie Moore obviously was loving it. And it just, it just, it just it kind of like sum up for me. You know, was the overall feeling after we realised that we weren't going to get relegated that the club could obviously it didn't really happen in the end, but the club could have tried to push on a little bit then. Yeah, I think so. But um, I think there was a lot going on. Ownership, different ownership came in and that. Um, after surviving, I think we survived with a game to go as well to be fair, because we went to Carlisle last game of the season as well, but yeah, you had that sense where we could kick on after after surviving that, but for whatever reason it didn't happen. So Fed's the next part of your career really, obviously we, we, we've, we've skipped a season um, and this is, we're looking at the season, this where, the relegation, the relegation right, season, yeah. if you, obviously you can see in front of you, it, it never really consistently got very good that season, did it? Um, you know, we, we didn't peak very high at any any points. Just personally for yourself, it, it almost seemed like, and I don't know whether you felt this as well, I, I feel like you mentioned it once or twice, maybe during the first two, three years of your career, you, you probably weren't favoured a lot by the Hartlepool fans compared to what you are now. What do you think that came down to in a way? I don't know. Um, sometimes when results are going against you, sometimes then, then people like in holding midfields don't, you don't always physically see what they give to the team. Um, sometimes people are made as a scapegoat, it's what it is, big enough character to take it on. My performances I always felt was okay at the time, um, but I was in a losing team, so I can understand the frustration for the club, they was in League One fighting for promotions at Championship not long before that and to see their club go from the heights of playoffs in League One, ten minutes away from the Championship to bottom of League Two and potentially getting relegated, you, you get the frustration and you, you, I know exactly how much it means to, to the people of Hartlepool, the club, so it is what it is, it's part and parcel of being a professional footballer, you, you're judged for your performances on, did, on Saturday every Did you day. ever take it to heart yourself or, or no. did, did, did it ever feel like it affected your performances or? No, not really, I don't think so. Um, big enough character to take a bit of criticism, I've, I've had it before, it's, it's what it is, yeah. You've got to take the highs, haven't you? And the lows with, with football, so obviously I was as gutted as anyone that we, we was relegated that season. Um, I was just about to say, mentioning yeah. this season then managerial changes, a few things going wrong, as you can see by in front of you, never really consistently getting the results. What do you think the key things that went wrong that season for Hartlepool? Well, ultimately on the pitch we weren't good enough, um, but there was also a lot of things going off off the field. I think every time we, we went on a way trip, we'd have a meeting as soon as we got to the hotel saying, you won't be being paid this Friday, it's probably going to come next week. Sometimes it'd come, sometimes it wouldn't. People don't see that. Like, um, it probably had an, an effect on the group as a whole. But ultimately, you're judged for for how you play on a Saturday, and we weren't good enough that that season. It obviously came down to the final day for you. 
if you hit next. I came down to the final day. Are you seeing a video in front of you? Um, the Doncaster. Yeah, it, 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 it comes down to the final day, and obviously we'll have a little talk through this. You can we'll pause it. We'll pause it at different moments. Um, but talk me kind of through how you're feeling as as this plays on. Um, what was the overriding emotion going into this day? Um, anxious, nervous. Um, we knew Doncaster was playing for the league title. I think they was top. Um, it was between them and Portsmouth, so we knew it'd be a tough game. We knew we had to win, or better. Was it Newport's result on the day? Um, so yeah, just just try and get the job done. Yeah, obviously, you can see really that. And we'll, we'll rewind it back. I don't know how it's one of them games. I don't know how much you ever remember. You have to win. Do you remember how you're feeling when obviously this one goes in, the Doncaster goal? Do you remember much about? No, it? I can't tell you much about Doncaster goal. To be honest with you, I can't remember it at all. Well, obviously, I, I, I can probably just imagine when that goal goes in, it, cr it crushes the whole team mentality in a way a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a great feeling, is it? You just automatically think the worst. And we obviously, as you can see, had a chance of the day. Rodney makes it 1-1. Yeah, and I just... think uh, I changed the game that, that day by coming off for Rodney, I think, actually. So I think he replaced me that day. Uh, came on and scored two, to be fair to him. Um, remember the feeling, actually, we're running onto the pitch when he, when he got the winning goal. I was just uh, we're just we're, we're gonna that we're gonna see that soon. Coming now. It is coming now. It, it, tell talk us through this winning goal. Obviously, in your eyes, as we're about to hit a counter attack here, we're about to you know, and Rodney scores. Talk me through the moment when he smashes the back of the net here. Like I say, it came on for me that day. So I was on the bench, and I just remember running onto the pitch with Batesy, the manager at the time, just. I think there was a couple of minutes left, or, or was it a couple of minutes? Yeah. Was it late on? Yeah. yeah. Um, thinking that we'd done enough, because I, I remember the Newport, I think there was drawing at the time. Um, so thinking we'd done enough to stay up, yeah. And when the full time whistle goes and you hit Newport, I've actually ended up bettering our result. Yeah. It, it, it did it almost feel like, in a way, it was obviously. We didn't play well at all that season. Relegation was always on the verge, but when you go through the emotions of that final day, did it feel deserved away? Did you feel that we'd been uh, that we sh we shouldn't have went down? No, in this league, two teams go down. So over the course of the season, it's generally the two two teams that are the worst team that season, and we got relegated that season, and we weren't good enough, and. Both on and off the pitch, we we struggled, so we deserve to go down, and it is what it is, I suppose. Obviously, we go down mm. into the national league. It was it three, four seasons in the national league, and overall, describe to me the big differences between the national league and league two. What you've seen over the course of the last few years. Um, top half. Off the National League, probably not too different to uh, League Two. When you've got your Knox Counties, Tramia were down there at the time, Stockport, Wrexham, they're all, they're all big clubs who probably see themselves as League clubs. Um, I always found that we struggled going to the Weymouths, teams like that, going to Bromley. I don't think I ever won at Bromley. Um, Maidenhead, we, we found it tough at times there. I think we got a couple of wins, but I think the first time we went there, we got beat on BT. Um, just the stadiums, the fan bases, they're generally a lot smaller than that, and I thought we tended to struggle going to them sort of places. Why, why did you end up staying with Hartlepool? You talked about in, in that League 2 season, you know, there's times you're not even doing it, but you're going to get paid, and you've decided to stick with Pebbles. But why? Why was this? Stubbornness, probably, from me. Like you said, I got a bit of stick that that season at times. Um, just to prove that I'm better than what they obviously thought at the time. Do you feel um, like you've proved that the fans or, or to yourself, or maybe a bit of both? 
No, because I, I know exactly what like I give. Um, I've said it before, I've had probably nine managers at the club, played under seven or eight of them, so I must have done something right in that time. Um, but yeah, just, I don't know, just, just to right the wrongs, I suppose. Um, the, the club was struggling at the time as well, so probably a loyalty there as well. Um, maybe as well when, when Muzza brought me in at the time, I, I was probably struggling for a club at the time as well. Um, so they took me on as well when I was struggling as well. So maybe something to do with that, loyalty again. Um, and ultimately trying to get Hartlepool back into the Football League. It's a perfect example really of turning around, not just, I suppose it's, you weren't turning around your career, but you were turning around a really negative situation and a positive and you know, you've gone, you went from the scapegoat to, to the ghost really, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure about that, but um, yeah, it's, a, it's a fun nickname, isn't it, the goat? Well, we'll, 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 we'll get on to that, we'll, 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 get on, we'll get on to the goat, but if you want, if you want to move on to the next slide anyways. Um, so, you've had a few managers, as you mentioned. Yeah. Um, we'll go th kind of through each one, and, and you know we'll talk a little bit about what they've kind of done for your career, positive or negative, really. We, we spoke obviously about Paul Murray bringing you in, and Ronnie Moore. Um, Ronnie Moore is, you know, it kind of goes down as a little bit of a Hartlepool legend, really, for especially for the Great Escape. But in term, how good was he, man management, and you know. Even going through the struggles, but making sure everyone was still on a really positive high note. Yeah, he kept it quite vibrant training. I think he kept things quite simple as well. I think uh, I watched a a podcast he did under the cosh not long ago actually, um, and he was just saying that he wanted to keep it as simple as possible. Um, four four two, pretty basic thingy, but like I say, he got he got the best out of the players with his man management. Um, and I think he said it himself that that great escape season probably goes right up there in his achievement as a manager, up there with his uh, promotions. So, yeah, Ronnie Moore did very well. Higgy had him twice, obviously, two different spells, and he's had a few different roles in the club. What was he like as a manager overall? Maybe probably didn't work off the way he wanted in the end. Yeah, and but. A good manager for you, or yeah, first time especially, um, very good. Probably, probably played as good as I have as well. Like I put it up with the last couple of years um, under Higgy's first spell. What was that? Was that played was a lot that, of football? Was that tactical from him or arm, arm around the just shoulder the type of thing? No, no, no. Just type of football he wanted. Probably suited me. Played really good football. Everything at the time was going through me. Um, so really enjoyed my my spell with Higgy the first time. Um, gave me a two year contract at the time um, I was captain under him for spells as well and, uh, and he had uh, his assistant uh, Curtis Fleming as well so really enjoyed my time under Higgy the first time Dave Jones <coughs> tough one really <laughs> um, it's, a tough, it's a tough one for Hartlepool fans really not the most you know liked person in, in the town obviously his situation Never really got got a good reputation at Hartlepool. Just talk me through any little you know Dave Jones stories you've got and what he was like as a manager at Hartlepool. Um, didn't do much to be fair during the week. Left his assistant and his coach to do a lot of the um, the training based sessions. Um, I don't know. I just just felt a bit negative with him. Personally, I played a lot of games under him, played like all the time under him, so uh, it wasn't because I wasn't playing, just, I don't know, it seemed like he wanted to change a lot off the field before getting it right on the field, so. Um, it was Dave Jones that moved, moved us away from Durham training, wasn't it? We trained over there for a bit, I think, so I don't know if it was Dave Jones, was it? Might not have been. I think we um, was down at the race course just across there to be fair with him. But he wanted a lot changed off the field before we got right on the field and probably ended up suffering because of it. It, it would, was it almost a case with Dave Jones that his experience managing, coaching Premier League that he almost expected to come in and just walk the role a little bit? 
Did that, is that what you kind of felt as players or? No, no. Um, I think a lot of the lads was excited because of what he'd done as a manager. He managed at the highest level in the Premier League. A couple of times with um, Southampton and Wolves, I think it was. Um, held in high regard, I think, in the manager's world. Um, but I think he'd been out of the game a few years when he came back to Hartlepool. So, um, yeah, like I said, he, he left quite a lot of the work down to his, his coach and his assistant at the time. Um, I don't know. I don't, for whatever reason, it didn't work out. Is what it is. And Dave Jones obviously moved on. We obviously kind of spoke about what happened that season. Um, National League, Craig Harrison comes in, and it almost feels like a little bit with Craig Harrison that it was the right person, but at the wrong time. I don't know. I, I, that's a more like a fan perspective. I don't know. Did you feel the same in a way? Yeah, really good guy. Um, obviously, came with a good record from TNS, was it, in Wales? Um, like I said, Top top guy, top like man management is he's very positive. Um, gone on to do well again in the Welsh league, um, but like you say, I think there was a lot of bad things going on behind the scenes. Maybe maybe right guy, wrong time, like you said. Um, yeah, gutted for him to be fair, because like I said, like the lads loved him as a guy, but for whatever reason, again, it didn't didn't quite work out. But. I, I would say there was a lot of problems off the field at that stage. How how does that work then? When obviously when Craig Harrison loses a, loses his job, how does that work in terms of how the players find out? In terms of him coming to the training ground saying goodbye, and obviously a manager like you, like you said is liked by the players. Is that a, does he go around and you know speak to everyone or? No, it's pretty cutthroat football. To be fair, it's just one day he's in, and you get a message off someone else at the club saying that he's been let go. Um, we actually went to meet him for a coffee, a few of the lads, uh, the day after. Um, what was his overall feeling then when, you, when you went and spoke to him? Uh, you don't tend to get too much into it, to be fair. I just, just thanked him for his efforts, like, and how he'd been with me. Um, but ultimately, the results weren't, weren't great, and football's a cutthroat business. and. When the results aren't going, going well, then you know your, your job's at risk. Did you, um, ever, did you ever feel like it was an expectation, Hartlepool, in the National League to walk it first time round and that's probably why you end up losing this job? Um, I, don't, I don't think we felt like we could walk it, but I think when you are a big club in a lower league, you, there is a certain expectation, but I don't think the club was ready behind the scenes to to really mount a challenge at the time. Um, like I said, there was a lot of things going on. We was having meetings most month, again about payments and whether we'd get paid or not. So there was a lot of problems going off the field and it was probably a, a tougher job for Craig Harrison than he'd, than he'd have wanted to. Beatty comes in next, um, you know, it comes into a role, but not all the experience in the world, but another one of them where he really probably gave everything to Hartlepool that he could. Yeah, again, a difficult situation to come in. To, um, kept it really simple after Craig Harrison left. Got the results we needed to, to be safe and and then took over properly, did he, at the end of that season, yeah. Um, tough job for a, a young manager with a lot of things going off, off the field. Like, when you're taking your coaching badges, I'm, I'm not sure you coached how to deal with certain situations off the field. and. Yeah, again, probably the wrong timing for him again. Difficult job for him. Richard Money, a very, very brief spell for Richard Money. One, one of them who've done different roles in the club, but also very experienced. Uh, what, just talk me through what he was like as, as a gaffer. Again, another guy that I think hadn't been in the job for a long time, in, in the manager seat for a while. Like... Um, not one of my favourite times at the club, to be fair. Didn't play too much. Um, did he? Was there a reason for that? Did he ever say why you weren't playing, or did you ever question why you weren't playing? No, he, he had a thing about big players. He wanted what, big, height. He wanted big 
big players in the team, yeah. Um, it's five foot eight, not tall, well, isn't it? No, five foot nine. All oh, right, sorry about that. <laughs> no, not not big enough. Um, I think Mags pulled out injured in the warm up one game. I think, and I came in. We beat Gateshead at home two one. I think it was. Following week, Mags is back in the team ahead of me. So we'd we'd won the game. I played well, and then he's playing a centre half in holding midfield in front of me. Four four. Purely his physical features and his attributes, um, size and that. So I was trying to annoy you a little bit. But he wanted to play football as well. So at the time, I thought I was as good a football as anyone at the club. So is that not it's strange? It, is that not at times where you think, but well, it's probably my type of move on from Hartlepool? It probably would have materialised like that if he just kept the job for longer. Yeah. Um, I'd say if, if he was in charge until the end of that season, I probably wouldn't have got a, another contract there. It's just managers' opinions, it is what it is. Um, luckily enough for me, he didn't last long in the job, so it worked out for me. Obviously, Higgy came back after that. We spoke about Higgy, if you want to move on. and Then, became, then came the era of Dave Challoner, which you've seen in front of you. Um, Talk me through Dave Chandler first comes in. Is was there any expectations from any of the lads? When you know you, you spoke about people coming in with experience, Dave Jones, the excitement. Uh, Dave Chandler obviously a very very good record with Fylde. Uh, what was the overall? Do you remember what the overall reaction was when he was appointed manager? Yeah, I think again the lads was excited because they they played against his file teams in the past and they was energetic, played good football, played attacking football, got at you. So, an attacking manager with a good record behind him, so everyone was excited for him to come in. Do you I spoke to a few players who'd played under him, who said he was very aggressive at times and <laughs> <laughs> very emotional at times, but um, yeah, again, excited for him to come in. Uh, I was, do you remember any of your first conversation with Dave Chalman? And kind of what, what he kind of said, he, obviously you're an experienced member of the, of the squad at this point, been here a long time. Um, is, was there anything he kind of said to you in terms of going forward? Not to me personally, but to the lads as a, um, as a whole, the midfielder has especially run more. Right. <laughs> Very stat based. Um, I think he had a player at Fylde called Crosdale that used to run a lot of kilometres every game. <laughs> is, that, um, is that your game? <laughs> so we had to get up to. I'm not sure I've got anywhere near um, the stats Crossdale ran, but yeah, he wanted us to, to be fitter, um, which obviously has benefited me as well, I think, massively. Um, I was just about to mention that, you know, we talk about Gary Liddell as the Benjamin Button, you know, the older he gets, the, the better he still gets, but, you know, the same is really seemed to happen with you as well. You know, when, when we contrast it compared to when you're saying you were the scapegoat more than years ago, how much do you feel like your game has improved in your fitness under Dave Chalmer? Yeah, well, he demands the, the intensity every day in training. Um, like I say, he demands a certain amount of numbers during a game as well. Uh, not quite Crossdale numbers, but we're getting there. Shelley's not far from, from them numbers, um, so he bumps my average up slightly. <laughs> um, yeah, um, like I say, the demands he puts on you every day in training is going to benefit someone like me who's the wrong side of 30 now. Um, very good for me physically, um, but I, I also played with a lot of injuries in the past that people didn't know about where managers was asking me to play because of the, the situation the club was in, um, having double hernia operations in the summers and that without people knowing, playing with them. But it is what it is, you play with injuries. Um, I'm free of them now. I've been free of them since for a while now, which has helped as well, because I didn't always train uh, before that, but I've trained every day since since the gaffer's come in. It's benefited me massively. Talk to me about what you said, his expectations, uh, even when we're winning. Uh, it, it still seems like he's got this expectation that we can always do better, which is fantastic. Um, just, just talk to me a little bit about that. And one thing that almost comes to mind a little bit is when you look at last year, Wealdstone away, um, 
you know, 7-2, scoring seven goals away from home, but he, he wasn't happy that we conceded them too. Yeah, he just, he just sets the bar very high. Um, yeah, he just has really high standards. Um, like you say, we win the game 7-2, he's not happy with the two goals we concede. Um, I've been in half-time team talks where we're 2-0 up. I think we was 2-1 up against Chesterfield <laughs> away the first season he came. came in, he's bollocking us, having a quarter us. We go out and win the, the second half. Well, I think the game's in, it's 5-1. He, um, Has he ever got at you directly? I, I know every manager sometimes you know, like go at a player because of something they've done wrong. I, I know he mentioned at the weekend, obviously he wasn't happy with Will because of the goal conceded. Has, has he ever given you that the hair dry treatment, I suppose? Uh, or is it more just the fact that because you're more of an experienced player, you, you, you know that you know where you need to do better in a way? No, I don't think anyone's safe in the dressing room <laughs> with him. Um, half time, like I say, you could be winning, drawing, losing. If, if he sees something that he's not happy with, he'll, he'll tell you. Um, I don't know, I can't, I can't remember if he's come for me personally. Maybe. Um, a Blythe game in pre-season last season. Um, might have had a little bit with him then. Um, but surely as a player, it's what you want, isn't it? Is, not, is that not what you want in terms of someone who just demands the best all of the time? Yeah, 100%. Um, probably similar in my personality as well myself. Um, the lads will probably tell you that themselves. We're very moany on the pitch, like to get onto people, um, like good standards and the gaffer likes that himself. I was about to speak about that, in terms of yourself, in it, I was on the pitch, I think a lot of the fans, and we certainly pick up on the press, that you're know you you're more than happy to have a, have a shout with someone, have a bit of a moan at someone, and you said that's true with you, your standards, do you, like, you must get on the lads' nerves a little bit, mate. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I think a, a lot of the la a new lads um, probably find it hard initially, but I'd like to think as soon as we're off the pitch, everything's nice and we get on. I don't dislike many people. Do, um, do you feel like now you've got the captain's armband, you warrant to give this out a little bit as well? No. No? No. Has, has that always been your game? I've been pretty similar with or without the armband, yeah. if I'm honest. Um, but yeah, I think yeah, I think a few of the younger, new lads don't like it too much <laughs> to start with. but. I'd like to think as soon as they got to know me properly that I'm only doing it I was about for to say, the good of the team and it, it's nothing personal. You and Gav Holland are obviously really good mates, you know, share the room on a way trip, share a car, you know, travel here, but you're at them all the time, aren't you? <laughs> what was Gav, is it? Um, I was at the end of the weekend as well, I saw you having to go with Gary as well. Me and Gary, Lidl probably argue as much as anyone on the pitch, but I get on with him as much as anyone in, in the team. As long as we all know that nothing's ever personal and, and we're all fighting in the, and pushing in the same direction and ultimately we, we all just want to win games of football and if that means we have to get onto each other now and again, if that means we have to encourage each other at times then it is what it is but I think as long as it doesn't ever get personal then, then there's nothing wrong with, wrong with that. Just finally going back to Dave Challoner, the last thing about him, does it really feel like under his management, you've seen the club at the worst, you've seen the club on a downhill trajectory, or do you feel like we can go on an uphill trajectory and, and you know the club can keep pushing on now? Yeah, well, I, I've not seen the the um, the connection between the fans and, and the club as good as it's been in the last year or so, uh, in my seven years at the, at the club. So. I think he's brought the whole club together. I think there's a style of football that gets the, the fans right behind you. Um, we get after teams, we attack teams. The way we play keeps the fans engaged in the game. So as long as we, we carry on that, I think it's only uphill from here. Should we move on? What have we got next? Your goals? Right, we're going to have a little look through Nicky Featherston's best goals. Don't get many, do you? 
Huh? And when you do what get them... What have I got? 17? Uh, 17 for the club? I mean, you don't get many, but I'm saying when you do get them, they all seem to be unbelievable bangers, don't they? No, they're not bad, are they? I was looking the other day before we played this video, uh, some of them on the left foot, some of them on the right foot. Uh, what, what, what foot are you? Are you just, just, just magic, both feet? Smack it when it's left foot. So let, let's have a little talk through some of these goals. So obviously, Exeter, in the cup, talk me through this one. What, what do you think that when you pick the ball up here? Uh, losing the game 2-0 at the time. Why not just, just hit it? Probably as good a goal as I'm going to, or good a hit them as I'm going to hit. Um, right behind the ball, flew in top corner. Magic, game. magic of the cup. Exactly. Magic of the cup. Talk me, talk me through some of these as we look through them. Another one where you... Another one, 2 nil down. Comes to me on the edge of box. Again, just shoot on target, left foot. Is, is it always just a case of whacking it and see what happens, or do you always know the flying in? Uh, I think you have an idea when you when you hit them that, that it's got a chance, and them two especially have, have been struck pretty well. It must be nice to score one like that at the Vic as well. Always nice. This one, you, it's it's almost it's almost a case of when you get the ball here, it's like a Frank Lampard make you pass and follow it in, into the box. And, and it's, is that the type of runs you'd probably like to make a little bit more? Um, you talk me through this one. Nobs just picked it up deeper, hasn't he? So just made a forward run. I think I've gone off in the kicker bamba. Just nicked the ball in front of the keeper. Nice timing. Oh, loving that, aren't you? Put yeah. the town in. Salford was going for the league title as well or something, or just before the playoffs, so nice to get one over them. This one? Chesterfield at home. 1 0 win, I think. It's another one, just uh, whacked with power. Left foot strike, yeah. <laughs> just did something. What, what, what do you prefer, left, left foot or right foot? Or? Well, I'm right footed, so I'd like to think, well, I'd probably do it to, if I'm going to strike a ball, I'd probably do it a left one. Oh, really? A little bit better, yeah. Another goal in front of the town and at the, the Vic. How nice is it to celebrate in front of fans like that? When you said, I know, yeah, you, no, I, 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 know we, goal, yeah. I know we joke, but you don't get many. But when you do, you, you obviously want to make the most of it, don't you? Yeah, there's probably no better feeling is there than scoring a goal. So it's probably the best feeling in football when you when you can score. You, as a holding midfielder, you don't get that feeling too often. So to, when you do get it, just this one's probably my favourite just because there's a bit more skill involved. Oh, it's unbelievable in this point. Uh, Did you know exactly what you wanted to do when you when, when you've done that or not? Yeah, I obviously knew what I was doing, but um when Woodsy put me through, I just seen the keeper come up close to me, so I took the ball away from him and he was off his line. If that's in the Premier League, you know, it's, it, that's all over, it's all, over, all over social media, isn't it? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, like I say, that, that's probably my favourite, just because of like the execution. It, it's probably a harder skill than just whacking a football. This one's the first one for the, the football club, so probably all Woodsy. I was going to say, you, you mentioned Woodsy there. Did another look where you linked up with Woodsy? You enjoyed playing with him there? Yeah, I think he got a few assists for me when I did score, so... Yeah, that's the first one. Is that your first goal for the club, is this? That was the first one for the club, yeah. Um, Newport, I think it was. I think that was like two minutes in the game, but I, the most I f thing I remember about that game is Toto got sent off straight from the kickoff after, so I had to play centre-half with Batesy as a two for Jeez. the next 70, 80 minutes. How did you find that? Against Big John Parking, so <laughs> luckily enough, Batesy uh, taught me through it for the, for the rest of the game. We'll come on to then, obviously, really, some of the best moments, or the best moment maybe you've probably had is in a Hartlepool shirt, I think you admit that yourself. Um, the playoff final last season, we're going to kind of talk through the whole game as a whole. Talk me through this moment, you've walked out with the captain's armband on, ready for kick-off. What's the nerves like at this point? Always control the nerves pretty well, to be fair, so not obviously understand the the severity of the of the game and how big it is and what it could potentially mean for the club getting promoted. So obviously you have those thoughts in your head, but in terms of nerves and that, always felt in control of that. Did you feel confident as a team that we that we'd always win? Yeah, I think so. I think we'd come through 
both playoff games pretty well. I think. I think we was three 0 up in the in the in the Bromley game. It was made a little bit more interesting towards the end, but I think they scored in in the final minute of the game to make it three two. So I don't think that was ever close. And I think I thought it was in full control of the the Stockport game as well. So yeah, going in to the game with massive confidence. Um, with a great belief that we could get the job done. Do you remember the noise when you walked out the tunnel of the 3,000 Hartlepool fans? I can't, to be honest, mate. Oh, just a blur, no, just, Yeah, just... Yeah. Don't, to be fair, we came out and our fans were facing us, weren't yeah, they? So yeah. I, yeah, it felt like there was more than the 3,000 that we were allowed, so... They obviously created a lot of noise, but in terms of remembering it, no, not a massive memory of it. Do you want to move on to the next one? Game goes on, Luke Armstrong pops up like he always does and gets the first goal. It was a case of Luke Armstrong being in the right area at the right time like he always was, wasn't it? And how much of that in the celebrations do you, do you remember? Yeah, I remember the goal really well. I think he took it really well. Um, he got that extra touch just before the, the defender comes landing in and the finish was very good. Um, did, did you feel like we were controlling the game up to that point? I thought, well? it, was, I thought it was very good first half, that. Um, I thought we had a few chances. I watched it back. Um, I thought it was well on top first half, actually. I know they had a, a goal disallowed, which they'd be pretty disappointed with, but on the whole, I thought we played well in that first half. And you saw it playing well. Surely a few of the lads might have made a little bit nervous, but we seemed to calm the nerves down straight away. And play, we played our game quite well, didn't we? Yeah, I, I thought so, yeah. Like I said, I think there's a mad stat where once we've gone in front... We, we rarely get beat. We, yeah, I think... I think in the last 30 games, the gaffer mentioned it out the weekend, actually, where when we do go in front, I think we haven't lost in the last 30 games. So when we, when we did go in front, we're pretty, pretty confident we can go on and win the game. Then. I move on. At this moment, um, one nil up, last 30 seconds of the game, do you feel like, we'll talk about their goalkeeper score, which is mental, but did you feel like a goal was coming from them? Or did it almost get to the point where you've, you've had the whole storm and you had the last 30 seconds, right, right, we'll just defend this and it's done? No, I, I thought we defended really well, I thought Brad had dealt with pretty much everything really well before then. Um, Lids was, I think he won everything that day at Lids. Um, so I thought, yeah, there was a lot of long balls and pressure at the time, but I thought we dealt with it really well. Your obviously mentality as players are going to be a lot different to always up in the press box and as fans, but it almost felt like when they scored that goal that it was done and that they'd always go on to win it, uh, you know, and I, I remember looking at you in the huddle. What was being said in that huddle in terms of how are you going to, how are you going to pick yourselves back up from that? The huddle came in extra time, didn't it? At the full time, so they've just scored full time with all goals. What do you mean when the gaffer gets us together? Yeah. Oh, I, I just remember being really angry with Brad, if I'm totally honest. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, Word said? Just, it, it was probably a more built up frustration from like my time at the club where I've had the lows with a couple of minutes away from, from sealing promotion and obviously a mistake from Brad ends up costing us a goal and like you say the momentum was was with Toki at the time um, so my overriding feeling was <laughs> pretty angry pretty frustrated um, in the, the goalkeeper scoring as well it, it, it never happens and it's especially the way he's come up and won that header was it a case of because he's obviously the extra man no one's going to mark him surely he's not going to get his head on it do you, like, do you remember like is anyone thinking we better pick this lad up um, I think he'd come up for the corner and then it got cleared and then, they then he ended up back. coming yeah. back so I didn't actually know until Ry Donaldson told me in extra time that the keeper had scored I wasn't aware that it was the keeper that scored at the time I was just <laughs> so you didn't see him dancing no no didn't see any that, of the, the celebration or anything to be fair uh, again my my feeling was just a, a massive anger and frustration at the time did you feel like we'd still be able to go on and <coughs> win the game after that, or did you? Did you? I wasn't even thinking about anything. I was just like Furious. my head had gone at the time. Yeah, 
Uh, did you feel like that the other lads as well? Did you feel like their heads had gone, or was it, was it almost a calmness to everybody else? No, I think the the gaffer was good in uh, the full time team talk where he was like, right, we've got Paul Brad out there. Yeah, you know exactly what I mean. Because <laughs> um, I think Brad had been brilliant for us since he had come in. Yeah. Um, but little did I know that Brad had end up pulling me out of the crap as well. Well so. we're gonna we're gonna get onto that so we'll keep that for now. Yeah. Um like I said, just a massive frustration and anger at the time, yeah. So as you just mentioned, we talk about the highs of your career but obviously at the law. Um you've stepped up to hit the first penalty, you've scored every single one this season. Talk me through that walk up Coverland, I don't know if you remember, but Coverland is obviously saying a few words to you, I don't know how much you remember that, and why you decided, did you always, were you always going to go that left-hand side keeper's right? I feel, it, I feel like uh, like the walk-up for me felt nothing, no nerves, no, nothing, no, never, just just try and put myself in, in the situation as it is then. Um, hit the penalty quite well. Um, were you always going that left, left side? I was always going that way, I feel, like yeah. you took, I feel like a lot of your penalties that season were that side. I felt like if I place the ball exactly where I want to, whether the keeper goes the right way or not, then it's usually a good enough penalty to score. What was he, what was he saying um, before the penalty? Was he saying it? Because I know a lot of the lads... I don't, I don't know if I know, to be honest. I won't, won't be able to tell you. Um, apparently he went really early. I've, I've seen the penalty back. I don't think it's a bad penalty. Um, so, what's that feeling though when when you see you saved just because you know you, I, I watched the video back yesterday and, and you, you've, you've just almost screamed into the air because of the frustration which I can imagine how how were you feeling then because I, I imagine that must be feeling a bit rock bottom at that point just get that feeling again where <laughs> like when you've had it in the past where you get relegated like it's I don't know like have, have we wasted an opportunity like to go up that season but um, for me, a, a penalty shootout is a is a lot a lottery anyway. Like I thought, we'd done played well enough during that season to to deserve to go up and done enough in the game. I think we still created chances in the extra time. So to bounce back off after the frustration of conceding a late goal to a keeper as well, I thought we reacted really well in in the in the extra time. So did you feel like as as captain that you? That you'd let anyone down or not, or, or did you not even think? No, that? no, no. Because I, I, I know none of the lads would have felt that. But I'm just thinking no, personally no, for yourself. No, not. Obviously, I was absolutely gutted that I missed the penalty, but no, not not that I'd let anyone down. No one, no one means to miss a penalty. Better players than me have missed penalties. I, say, I know in the past. I know we've won, but do, do you ever think about it or dwell on it at all? No, no, no. no. Why no. would you suppose when we've gone up? But maybe I would if if we'd lost. If we'd lost, yeah. Um, like I say, penalty shootouts are lost in can go either way. Um, I didn't, I don't think it was a bad penalty, I don't think I miss it, the penalty. It's just a good save and luckily for me we went on and won it. I was saying, in terms of the rest of the shootout, Luke Armstrong steps up next and he's already got his goal, he's been fantastic all season and he misses it as well. The keeper at this point, he saved, you know, two, he scored a goal. Are you thinking now, this is just not our day? No. I just um, still feel quite confident. I think they missed their first two as well, didn't they? So, like, I don't know. Um, I can't even remember the feeling at the time, to be honest. So I, I, I couldn't tell you what I was feeling. Just obviously gutted I'd, I'd missed my penalty. Uh, gutted for Luke Armstrong because he'd missed his. And like you say, he'd been unbelievable for... He, I'd say, resorts on him... But mainly Luke coming changed the course of our season because we were playing well anyway up until that point. We just didn't have anyone finishing off the, the chances we were creating. So I was gutted for Luke that he missed his because, like I say, he did probably change the course of our season that season. Obviously, the penalty shootout goes on. As it does, Brad James, who he said <laughs> made that mistake and you're absolutely furious with, wins us the game. and. Just try and explain, even if you can, that feeling when James tips onto the bar, and that's it. We've we've done it. 
Yeah, it, always, it, felt, it almost felt like, sorry, it almost felt like three, up to nearly 300 appearances, the six, seven years you've been here, it led to that to moment. To that moment, yeah, yeah, possibly. Um, I never think too much into it like that, to be honest, but yeah, if, if, from the outside looking in, yeah, all the hard work and all the lows, the relegation, and then to then be a part of a squad that got promoted was as good a feeling as ever. A bit surreal at the time. Um, from wanting to smack Brad James at one point to <laughs> wanting to give him a big hug after and say thank you for pulling me out the, the crap, I suppose. Um, yeah, just massive elation. I just remember the, the celebrations in, in Bristol that night with the fans and seeing how much it meant to, to people and what the club means to people and what it can do to a, to a town. Just unbelievable. Does Nicky Featherston get emotional? Uh, my wife would probably tell you not. Um, <laughs> no, probably not. The closest I came to tears was probably seeing Ross Turnbull. I seen him um, when I was walking over to do the interview for, for BT after the game. Um, and he, he got emotional because he'd probably seen what some of us lads had been through at the at the time. As in Russ Turnbull, who's won a Champions League yeah. medal. Probably didn't cry at that, yeah. Um, but, yeah, he's obviously attached to quite a few of the lads that had been at the club through the tough times and then to see us get promoted probably, probably meant a lot to him. I know a lot of the lads get on really well with him, so that was probably as close as it came to, to me personally getting emotional. But for me, it was just a massive sense of relief. Just to, we've got the job done. The club's back to where we belong. Um, it was the first time it dropped out of the football league, and then to get them back to where we belong probably meant everything to us. Yeah. The cel and you said the celebrations in the Millennium Square, and yeah. even going on a few weeks later to the bus tour and around the town and. It, it, it did feel surreal, didn't it? It felt like, it felt like it never actually happened. It felt like a dream. Um, yeah. and, and you you've been there when Hartlepool fans are crying emotionally and deservedly because we've been relegated, and there they are crying with tears of joy, and you're lifted on someone's shoulders in Millennium Square, and what what a t what a turnaround, and what what a way to you know to hit the peak of your Hartlepool career. Yeah, um, like I say, you probably don't understand how much it means to. To people, the club, when you're playing for them, um, maybe different when I've seen how much it means to people getting relegated. But um, sometimes people are only at clubs for a short amount of time, and you don't get to to see what it means to to one people working at the ground. And I know a lot of you who people are Hartlepool fans yourselves, um, and how much it means to you. Again, how much it means to people around the town how much it lifts the town. I don't think I've seen the town in a better place since I've been here personally again. I know how much it influence you can have on a town as a football club and you probably don't understand that until you do have these moments of success. Um, Hartley Pub being back in the EFL only benefits everyone in the town. And we saw that first hand with the celebrations in Bristol I don't know how many fans were there, but what a turnout. And then the turnout for the open top bus, unbelievable again. There's people just in their windows, people, <laughs> people who have probably never even watched football in their life in oh, Hartlepool. Just different generations as well. You've got young kids to, I've seen 70, 80 year old men and women. Like, you, like I said, just to see how much it means to them to get Hartlepool back to where we belong. Just everything. So Nicky Featherston, 300 appearances. A lot of people are saying that you, you are going to go down and you pretty much already are a club legend. Do you, do you feel that at all in terms of personally yourself and when we spoke about the highs and lows? No, not, not right now. Maybe when you finish your career, get another, get another playoff promotion in there <laughs> would be nice. Um, uh, but... The club is in a much better place now to when I first came and I think as a player 
who's been at the club seven years. I think that's all you can ask for. Um, in terms of being a legend, not something I think about right now. Not, not something that I've ever thought as as a player. Like I said, you might look differently at it after you finish your career. But I said the word legends got thrown about a little bit, but the word goat was thought about <laughs> a little bit earlier on. It, it's picked up the last few seasons, having the greatest of all time. Do you, do you just take it? Do you just take it in your stride? Do you, do you laugh every time you see it, or just see it as a yeah, as a bit of fun? Um, my mates probably jump on it more than I do. Um, like I say, just just a bit of fun in it between the fans and. And myself and, and the club, so like I said before, I've, I've had far worse things called than, than the girls, so I'll, I'll take it now. Yeah. yeah. How, how old are you now? 30, 35? 35? Oh, I'm way off it, am I? 30? Oh, sorry, feds, I'm way off it. 33 in two weeks. Hey, I'm I'm sorry, sorry, feds, but 33, you're, you're really hitting, uh, you're probably for you, your peak. Um, have you thought about the future at all in terms of when you, in terms of the next few years, and how do you ever think about? I know you know it's. Do you think about when you might think about the end of Nicky Felson's career? Well, it's it's coming up, yeah. It's something you do think about. Um, Lids is the PFA manager, so I spoke to him about maybe like getting the coaching badges coming. It's probably something I, I wouldn't want to do, but you if would. no, if. It covers your back. You might think differently again once you once you're out of the game. Uh, but right now, it's not something I'm interested in. But it's probably good to get something behind you, such as the coaching and that. But yeah, I've got a two-year contract now, so over these next two years, definitely looking at what I could potentially do after after football. So, you, you, would you say Hartlepool will be the last club in your career, or it, who, knows? who knows? Who knows? But. See if Hartlepool want me in two years' time. Nicky, anyway, thank you very much. Congratulations on 300 and here's to many more. Perfect.